Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Rose Farah. And I'm Julia Kaufman. And we're co-chairs of the Student Advisory Board to the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute. Thank you all for coming, we're really excited. So this is our third annual Global Ideas Local Impact event, which is hosted by the Student Advisory Board to the Duke Human Rights Center as a celebration of human rights opportunities at Duke and in the world. Um, so I figured I'd tell you a little bit about the Duke Human Rights Center and what we do here. So the Duke Human Rights Center brings together an interdisciplinary group of scholars, staff, and students to promote new understandings about human rights issues. Our goal is to foster collaborative, cross-disciplinary, and critical thinking about human rights in both local and global contexts. We put an emphasis on experiences that encourage awareness and activism, including human rights summer research grants, an event series on gentrification and Durham's future, the Coons Human Rights Prize, the Duke Immerse Program on Rights and Identities in the Americas, and the new Human Rights Certificate. The Duke Human Rights Center has been a defining part of my and many others college experiences in that it has extended my education beyond ideas and theories to studying the people who actually do human rights work and who need human rights protection. The Duke Human Rights Center has shaped my identity as a human rights activist, my sense of belonging in Durham, and my drive to assert the importance of respect for human rights, and I am so thankful. If you have questions about the center's programs, you can reach out to the amazing Emily Stewart at um, the Duke Human Rights Center's program coordinator at emily.stort at duke.edu. Um, and I'd also like to recognize our practitioner in residence, Catherine Coleman Flowers, who's here today. I don't know if she wants to stand, but she's here in the crowd. Um, and with, yeah, back there, there she is. And with that, I'll now introduce Robin Kirk, co-director of the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute. Thank you all. I'm actually not your main introducer today, but I asked to be given a moment to speak. Um, thank you all for coming, and I really uh, always look forward to this event and to hear what um, students have been doing and also to hear from our alumni. One of the things that um, we heard as we were thinking about the Human Rights Certificate was how difficult it was for students who might be interested in human rights or social justice careers to learn about what could be done professionally after they graduated from Duke. So that's part of the genesis of this idea is bringing really cool people back to Duke who have gone uh, through the classes and have gone through the Duke Engage and have gone through internships, et cetera, and are doing really creative, interesting things around social justice with their lives. Um, and part of the reason that we've been able to do this and part of the reason why we have a new human rights certificate, we're going to be graduating our first human rights certificate students this May is because of Bill Chafe. And I want to just formally thank him and also um, talk a little bit about how important he's been to the human rights certificate, to the Duke Human Rights Center, and in general, the whole quest for social justice, not only in our university and in our town, in our state, but in, in the United States. Um, Bill has been on the executive committee uh, for the Duke Human Rights Center um, for, for several years. He's been a crucial partner in so many of our projects. I think a number of you here have gone with Bill and Bob Korstadt to South Africa. You've also been in Bill's Duke Immerse classes. You've learned about the civil rights movement from him, one of the preeminent scholars in the United States. Uh, without him, we would not have a human rights certificate. Bill's support and his ingenuity and his persistence, which he knows very well, was part of the reason why we were able to convince the university to implement a new certificate. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of Bill's thinking and Bill's influence in these presentations today. Um, one of the things that Bill really brought to the thinking around the Human Rights Center was this idea that we, we must see human rights global, globally, but we can't lose sight of human rights locally. There are tons of human rights issues that are literally at our doorsteps in the American South, in North Carolina, in Durham, and in the university right here. And it's been crucial for us to be learning from, Duke, from Bill Chafe and also to be following in his footsteps to make human rights something very real and something very present on our own campus. Um, Bill will continue to be a very valued member of our faculty advisory board, for which we're very grateful. And I think, and I also want to let people know that in addition, uh, Students who are interested in human rights or interested in the human rights certificate 
will be benefiting very much from Bill and his wife Lorna's generosity in the donation of funds for a special human rights research fund that we will start to use next year. And this is going to help bring a lot of these research projects to you um, and to help students really uh, dig into the issues that they care about. So I just wanted to say, uh, before I introduce you, Bill, that we are so pleased and so grateful that you chose to walk some of your path with us. And we look forward to continuing to expand opportunities for students and human rights with your and Lorna's support. So please join me in thanking Bill Chafe. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> well, first thing I want to say is thank you, Robin, for that lovely statement. I also want to say I think how important it is that we are we are a community. Many of us are here today. Uh, we have been we have been working together for years to try to make a difference at Duke, uh, and uh, I think we've done that a little bit. We even we increased. Well, while I was dean, we increased the number of non-white students in the undergraduate population from 15% to 35%. Uh, and we more than doubled the number of black faculty, and that was an important step forward. And the Human Rights Center is very much part of that, all, all that, and I've been thrilled to be associated with the Human Rights Center for these years. Uh, the Student Advisory Board is fantastic. Uh, they do so much of the really critical work for us. And I wonder if we get all those people who are members of the Student Advisory Board to stand up and be recognized. Great. And the Faculty Advisory Board, which is more than 20 people, is also pivotal to all of this. Uh, and are there members of the Faculty Advisory Board who could stand up? Bob. Hey, Erica. Yay, team. Yay, team. Uh, uh, this has been really uh, an amazing experience, and I think that this integration and complementarity of the students and the faculty working together has made a, a very, very large difference. I'm delighted that uh, we were able to create this certificate. We have six seniors who are graduating with the Human Rights Certificate. I think some of them are here. If they could stand up, that would be great. And then I want to talk a little bit about where we are today. Uh, most of you, I think, are aware that we are coming up to the 50th reunion of the class of 1968. And next year will be the 50th reunion of the class of 69. The class of 68, uh, about 150 of them, went and, and the after aftermath of Dr. King's assassination, went to the president's house and demanded that he take action in response to this, including resigning from a segregated country club that he belonged to. Also, that the president and the university double, at least at a minimum, the wages of the primarily black working force at Duke, which was getting paid less than half of the minimum wage, and that their union be recognized, Local 77. They then went to campus, and for five days and five nights, as many as 2,500 of those students occupied the squad, demanding action on those issues. Uh, and eventually, they at least succeeded in doubling the wages, although union recognition took a while but longer. But this was really the first example of the kind of collective commitment and engagement on the part of a large, large number of Duke students. And it was a terrific precedent that we set. A year later, of course, black students occupied Allen Building because they had been ignored. They had been at Duke since 63, many, some of them, but they had been ignored. And finally, they too got some recognition in terms of the creation of a black studies program. What you may not recognize is that two years ago, the students who occupied Allen Building again in 2016 had a list of demands. If you go back and look at their list of demands, they are almost literally identical to those of 50 years earlier. So we have a long way to go, and you are a critical part of, of that, that, that whole venture. In that connection, I just want to talk about two or three events that are coming up, which I hope you'll be able to attend. First of all, on April 4th, we'll have a memorial service in honor of Dr. King at the Divinity School in Goodson Chapel. Uh, and we will have that at 5.15. At 
we'll have a very important panel of contemporary women students and leaders of the Vigil in 68, women leaders, talking about women's activism and leadership on campus. That will be in 217 Perkins upstairs, uh, also at, at 6.30 the same night, April 4th. On April 9th, we have a wonderful leader from South Africa who is a Jesuit priest, uh, but also someone who is very, very committed to the LGBT movement and to helping those who are most poor in South Africa. He will be talking about his work in Project Hope uh, on April 9th at 12 o'clock at the uh, Forum for Scholars uh, and, and Publics uh, over here in 11 uh, Chem. That's, that is co-sponsored by the Human Rights Center and, um, and, and by the, um, uh, the Forum for Scholars and and publics. And finally, we have a series of vigil-related events starting on April 12th, including a performance that we are sponsoring by Mike Wiley, uh, which will be in the Divinity School on the night of April 12th. Uh, and I hope that you can all be part of that because it's really important as we care about these issues to recognize they have a history and that we are part of that history. And the only way that history has a purpose is if we continue its aspirations and bring it to fruition. So thank you so much. Thank you so much again, Bill. So we are now going to start one of my favorite parts of the program, which is the research slam. So we have students who are involved in research at the Duke Human Rights Center who each have two minutes exactly with a timer to present their research to us. Um, so. I'm going to ask all the students to come up, please. Um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves and their work, uh, and then begin the timer uh, so they can start their research. So we'll start with T. Hughes. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, <laughs> my name is T. Hughes. I am a sophomore. Uh, I am studying international comparative studies with a concentration in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I am also hoping to pursue the human rights certificate. Uh, so I participated last fall in Duke Immerse's Rights and Identities program. Uh, that program was an incredibly transformative experience for me, um, not only because I was able to get really uh, close and intimate with a group of Duke students, like with like interests to mine, um, but I was also able to travel to Mexico um, and conduct research uh, on a subject that really fascinated me. Um, so my research that I conducted last fall uh, all culminated into a, a website project um, in which I investigated a case study of two genres of music. Um, my goal was to understand how music and pop culture play a role in Mexican migration over the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so the genres that I investigated were uh, a variation of the traditional Mexican genre banda um, in the new form of Mexican narco corridos. Um, that genre basically harkens on the stories of the mountains in traditional Mexico, but retell um, the affairs of narco traficantes, people um, conducting the narco trade across the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and I wanted to compare that to a more uh, homebound uh, genre to me, which is gangster rap um, from Brooklyn, New York, the city that I'm from. Uh, what I wanted to do by comparing these two genres um, was figure out how um, people from different nations can connect through music and uh, redeem voices that have seemed to be lost through human, viola human rights violations throughout time. Uh, thank you very much. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Pranav Ganapathy. I'm a sophomore undergraduate here studying economics and global health. So I'm part of a research team here uh, as part of the Bass Connections Initiative called Addressing Global Health Needs Among Refugee Children and Families in Durham. 
And uh, so the, my research really comes from the fact that over the past couple of years, North Carolina has really served as a home for many of the refugees that have come into the United States. And in fact, specifically Durham um, has accepted over 14% of those refugees. Um, and many of these refugee families that come to the United States, they are given you know, a bit of support in their transition, but after a couple of months, they're, they're really left to fend for themselves. And as many of you know, uh, healthcare here in the United States is an extremely complex system that's not uh, really easy to navigate for someone who, uh, who hasn't really spent time accust uh, you know, being accustomed to the, to the system here. Uh, so what we wanted to do was see what the barriers to care for refugee families in Durham was. And we looked at that through two lenses. First, we wanted to talk to these families, and then we also wanted to work with the organizations that had been serving them and um, helping them with their resettlement. Um, and so earlier this year, we conducted focus groups with families in French, Swahili, uh, Arabic, and Somali, and uh, kind of spoke to them about some of the difficulties to care that they were having, and things like transportation, understanding how over-the-counter medications and the prescription system work, uh, basic communication with their doctors were things that really came to light. Um, we just recently sent out a host of surveys to organizations in North Carolina and all around the world to understand how exactly they work with refugees, and we're in the process of distilling those results right now. Um, I highly encourage you guys to come out to the Bass Connections Fair on April 18th, where we will be uh, talking a little bit more about our work. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, how do I start? There's a Oh, okay. Oh, all right, got it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Helen Yu. I'm a senior at Duke, um, and I'm majoring in International Comparative Studies with a focus in China and East Asia and Chinese language. All right. Oh, right here? OK. All right. So two years ago, Professor Robin Kirk started a Bass Connections project um, where I and nine other students began to explore memorialization at Duke. Uh, over that time, we've documented all the sites that we've seen, plaques, statues, buildings. And some of these sites have become so normalized to us that you'll hear people say, oh, let's meet in front of Craven without actually knowing who Braxton Craven was. Uh, just FYI, he was a Trinity College president, and he owned two child slaves when it was very abnormal to do so in the area. So of over 300 sites that we found, over half of them are dedicated to white men. 70% are for white people in general. A total of eight sites are for staff and 25 sites are for people of color. As a woman of color, uh, I found that there are three sites for women of color on campus. Three out of 327 sites that we found. So some people may ask, what if white men just did more? And we looked at that too. With help from the archives, we researched people who have persevered and achieved when the odds were against them, but were never remembered. Uh, people like Caroline, who raised the Duke kids, all four of them, as a house slave. Uh, people like Oliver Harvey, who started Local 77 and um, unionized the university workers. Or the student body of 1972, who boycotted non-union lettuce in solidarity with the farm workers' movement. So this research is very close to us. It's where we eat, sleep, and study. And uh, Duke condemns the students who write racial slurs and people who host parties with offensive themes, yet the physical campus itself fails to address this contentious history. It fails to uplift people who have been targets of discrimination, and it also fails to commemorate instances of student activism. So this is a story we're being told right now, but it doesn't have to say the same forever. OK, I'm done. <laughs> Oh, that was good. Um, my name's Ibrahim Butt. I am a sophomore uh, studying political science and history and also hopefully getting the human rights certificate. So I'll just go ahead and start. So the research that I have been conducting um, investigates how governments approach conflicts within human rights. So for example, when two human rights come into conflict, governments normally leave it up to the judiciary of the country to determine which human right bests the other. Um, so I've been doing research with Professor Dewara in the Keenan Institute 
um, to see when human rights such as the right to religious freedom and the right for women and the right um, for LGBTQIA plus people, when they come into conflict, when they come into conflict, how do governments approach those situations? Um, so instead of boring you with like legal terms such as proportionality analysis, balanced resolutions, due process rights, I'm going to give you an example of one country I've been working on. Um, that country is India, and I've been working on a case where the right to privacy was guaranteed um, under the Indian constitution. But what does that right to privacy mean? Um, so India had rolled out an Aadhaar scheme, which is a biometric data scheme that tried to register 1.19 billion Indian people. Um, that right to um, that Aadhaar scheme linked um, government affairs, healthcare access, pensions to this one number of Indians. However, it was ruled to violate the right to privacy. Um, so governments, so the Indian government ruled that, and the judiciary ruled that the right to privacy was greater than the right for national security, um, the right to collect data, all those different human rights that we take for granted. However, this isn't happening across the world. What we're seeing across the world is that governments are ruling in favor um, of human rights, however, also restricting those human rights. We've seen that in the United States with um, Whole Women's Health versus Hellestead, which uh, ruled that um, the Texas abortion clinics couldn't violate the women's rights to access abortion. We've seen that with Oberfell versus Hodges, Masterpiece Bakery versus the state of Colorado. I would urge you to always look at these cases to see how governments rule and judiciaries rule when two human rights are violated. Thank you. All right, once again, my name is Julia Kaufman, and I'm a senior studying global health and international comparative studies with a certificate in human rights. So for the past year or so, I've been researching any and all intersections between global health and human rights in order to merge my two professional and personal passions. Not surprisingly, I found that the human rights framework is important and useful for global health efforts, and that health equity is important to human rights, as access to the highest attainable standard of health is a human right in and of itself, and because of the interdependence that all human rights have with each other. Poor health can keep us from going to school or to work, caring for our families, or fully participating in our communities. And the right to health cannot be realized without the realization of other rights that exist at the root of poverty, such as the rights to food, housing, and water. But how to best implement the right to health is very complicated, and some of the ways of using the human rights framework in health endeavors have been much more successful than others. So currently, in the Human Rights Certificate Capstone, I'm researching the role of a human rights-based approach to addressing maternal health in India. The right to health requires that care should be available, accessible, affordable, and of a high quality, or the AAAQ framework. And the Indian Constitution makes it mandatory for the state to ensure the fulfillment of the right to health for all without any discrimination. In examining the right to access maternal and child health in India from various large-scale household surveys conducted in the last two decades, researchers have found that the enjoyment of the rights of women and children towards achieving good health are very limited. Even after concerted efforts by the government and NGOs, there exist enormous amounts of socioeconomic inequalities. Looking forward, existing policies and programs should be adapted to better suit the needs of different people in different parts of the country. Continuing to make women aware of their rights and facilitating their participation in health-related decision-making has great potential to expose gaps in current health services. Prioritizing participation, non-discrimination, and accountability in health policies will help us work towards maternal health for all, including those at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Barahona. I am a senior. I study history, Latino studies, and human rights. Go back to writing. The Duke Latinos from 1920 to 1960 are waiting for their story to be told. This was said to me by Roberto Lopez, class of 1996. He was the founder of the Roe chapter of La Unidad Latina, the Latino Fred on campus. As a historian, my most important goal is that the very communities that I study are the main beneficiaries of my direct research. Our work as intellectuals and academics must be to empower our communities with the knowledge we are able to produce. My thesis historicizes Latinx students from 1926 to the present day. 
I chronicle the life of Rodolfo Rivera, a Puerto Rican student from a wealthy family from Barranquitas, Puerto Rico, who comes to Duke University in pursuit of a doctorate degree in history. I look at how Rodolfo Rivera navigates a segregated Duke University and a segregated US South. He's able to date white women at a time when white terror spread throughout the state and black men were being lynched for even speaking to white women. You know, Rivera was white enough to have publicly dated a white woman in North Carolina and eventually married one in Virginia later on. So my first chapter looks at the 1920s and 1930s and how white passing Latinos are able to come to Duke and what type of Latino is coming, an elite, wealthy, white passing student. In my second chapter, I chronicle the life, the club life at Duke University and the creation of the Cosmopolitan Club, International Club and Pan American Club. I look at the history of students, the history of the world and how it all relates and comes together as one. And so my main goal is to connect Latinx students, Duke University, white supremacy and the history of US global power. Thank you. All righty, hey y'all, my name is Cole Wicker. I'm a senior majoring in cultural anthropology and pursuing a certificate in uh, human rights and documentary studies. All right, quick show of hands. Who here has been to Jordan Lake before? It's about 30 minutes from here, a few people in the room. So if you don't know what Jordan Lake is, it's, a, it's only 30 minutes away, man-made lake created in the 1970s. I was born and raised in Bear Creek, North Carolina, a little over an hour from here, and I spent much of my summer exploring the lake, uh, inner tubing, kayaking, all that fun stuff. And I always heard stories of, like, there was a town before the lake, what was going on. And when I got to Duke my senior year, I'm like, I want to explore something that was close to home. I picked Jordan Lake, and I decided that I wanted to research and find out what really lied below the water surface, if you will. So this past year, I've actually spent time talking to uh, people that were displaced from the lake, exploring about 150 newspaper articles that kind of told the story of who was living there and what was going on. My project focuses on memory and displacement as it relates to memory and how we can recognize the folks that were displaced from the lake um, and encourage the people that are using the lake today for recreation um, to actually engage with its past. Uh, in my first chapter, I focus on Jordan Lake as a physical space. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers created the lake in, in the 1970s uh, and as a result, actually used the legacies of indigenous folks and uh, the farmers that toil um, tilled the land, excuse me, um, to stake a claim to the land. And uh, in 1968, there was a, um, a couple of court cases that actually caused the um, Army Corps to sue, displace, sue, displace um, farmers that were living on the land. Moving forward from there, I wanted to explore the narratives that people actually had um, during their displacement, what did it feel like to move up from your home, to move to Harnett County, to move just down the road? It didn't matter. They, there was a sense of loss, and I wanted to find that out. And in my final chapter, I look at the people that are actually using the lake today, the people like me that are kayaking, the people that are just spending time on the beach, and seeing how we interact with the lake's history. Um, this is all eight seconds. This is all in hopes of putting a um, presentation forward to the state park system to um, commemorate the people that were displaced. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you again to all our students. That was amazing. So inspiring, really. Yes. Um, and now Julia will be back up to introduce our amazing alumni panel. So thank you again. Um, so today participating in our alumni panel, we have David Siegel, class of 2006, and Erpita Verges, class of 2015, and also Hardy View, class of 1993, who's in a cab on the way here from the airport. His flight was delayed, so we'll see if he makes it on time. It could be an exciting entrance, or he just might not make it. But David, if you want to come sit up here. Oh, yeah. So here they are. Um, so David Siegel, 
currently joins the Center for Business and Human Rights at NYU Stern School of Business as a policy associate focusing on the recruitment and migration of construction workers from South Asia to the Arabian Gulf. From 2012 to 2015, David directed the, hum David directed the Human Rights in an Iran unit at the City University of New York, where he assisted the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. From 2010 to 2012, he served as an associate in the Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch, where he conducted research on human rights issues in the Arabian Gulf region. From 2009 to 2010, he was a research assistant at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute in Israel. And David holds um, a master's in Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University and a bachelor's in public policy from Duke University. And Arpita currently works with UN Women, the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment as a Gender and Humanitarian Action Analyst in New York. As part of UN Women's Humanitarian Action and Crisis Response Office in New York, Arpita supports the team in ensuring that responses to crises across the globe are planned, implemented, and evaluated in a way that serves and empowers women and girls throughout every aspect of humanitarian action. Prior to her work with UN Women, Arpita worked with local women's civil society organizations focused on gender-based violence in India. This included field-based research programs, which have revealed failures in adopting victim-survivor-centric approaches by law enforcement in addressing human trafficking, as well as the development of a training pro program for the implementation of a national initiative to empower women and children against domestic violence and workplace harassment. After graduating from Duke University with a dual degree in International Comparative Studies and Philosophy, Erpita went on to receive a Master's in Global Governance and Diplomacy from the University of Oxford. So to all of you, welcome back to Duke, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a few questions for the panelists, and then we'll go through those and then open it up to questions from the audience. So to get started, um, what first drew you to human rights work, and how did you end up in this field? Hello, everybody. This Hi. is fun. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, Julia. Thank you to all the organizers for having us all here. It is lovely to be back. Um, this is uh, my sort of journey and exploration of what uh, the field of human rights is. Sort of uh, had a lot of transformative experiences here at Duke. Um, my entry point uh, was definitely through the women's rights movement. Um, and I have to say that it did start back at home. So I'm from India, from Kerala. Uh, uh, southern state in India from the city of Cochin. Uh, I left home when I was about 15 to, um, for my studies and have been away since. Um, but through a um, fund from Duke, it was a service-oriented leadership um, program that um, was run at Sanford. Uh, I had a research grant to conduct research anywhere in the world, and I chose to go back home to do that, um, partially because I just missed home. but. Uh, it was eye-opening. Um, it was difficult to sort of uh, recognize that this paradise that I grew up in also had a lot of problems. Um, and uh, the state is known uh, as God's own country. It has the highest HDI in the region. It is, you know, it's sort of this paradise. Um, but that was that summer was um, a turning point for me, and that's where I did the research that Julia referred to on human trafficking victims or survivors, and I'm understanding how the local enforcement officers there, themselves, law enforcement officers themselves, turned a blind eye to what that meant and what that looked like. Um, so that was sort of a first step for me into this. And since then, I've tried to sort of integrate a uh, gender lens to anything and everything that I've done, and different things, um, including the Duke Engage project here, led by none other than Robin Kirk, who's in the audience, uh, who's also a role model for me while I was here. It's sort of uh, learning from my experiences, hearing about the stories, uh, hearing about her work really helped me conceptualize what it meant to be a human rights practitioner and what that meant like or meant in a day-to-day -day basis and what a career looked like in that field. Um, 
those are just some of the things that I can go on for, on this for a while. But I'll hand over to my panelists here. But these are just some of the uh, key sort of experience that I had that led me to want to lead a career in this field. Yeah. Thanks, Arpita. And uh, I would just also like to, to echo um, uh, your thanks to the Duke Human Rights Center for hosting us um, uh, and to everybody individually in this room. And thank you, Julia, for, uh, for all your help uh, arranging uh, this. Um, I, I want to just start by saying how, uh, how heartening this is for me and how impressed I am by this center. Um, I, uh, w when I was at Duke, there, there was no Duke Human Rights Center. Um, I, think the, I think the Franklin Human Humanities Institute was a couple years old, but by, by that point, but um, but no human rights center. And 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 uh, since I've since I began engaging uh, with with Julia, um, and uh, and of, and especially since I arrived today, I've been thinking a lot about you know whether or not my trajectory would have been different uh, had there been a center here. Um, you know, just listening to the students, the 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 language that you're using, the frameworks that you're employing, were were not not even in my vocabulary when I was an undergrad. So you're already, um, you know, in in sort of a, an oblique answer to your question, you're already head and shoulders ahead of where I was um, um, at the, at a similar point. Um, I would not have have uh, have looked at things the way that you all are. Um, so I'm really impressed, and uh, you know, even just to to know that Craven is more aptly named than I ever ever realized. Um, <laughs> <laughs> interesting information, but all everything from uh, that you guys mentioned um, is really fascinating. Um, so, uh, so as I as I just sort of implied, I, I actually didn't necessarily know I would go into the human rights field when I was at Duke. Uh, I had always been sort of international studies oriented, um, uh, international relations, government. I had known that I was not going to be a scientist, basically, but I didn't know that I was going into human rights. Um, I would say even when I, even at the point when I graduated, uh, I had a sort of regional interest in the Middle East um, and, and maybe even a more specific interest in Israel-Palestine issues at that time, um, which I'll, I think, you know, we'll talk about as the conversation progresses, and I'd be happy to, uh, but not necessarily from a human rights perspective. Um, that only came when I went to Jerusalem after Duke um, and. Uh, you know, and and saw a lot of things on the ground, and had an experience that uh, I'll also talk about. But uh, but only when I came back did I realize that human rights was the perspective I want, from which I wanted to approach it, not necessarily diplomacy, international relations, uh, but human rights. And that's when I joined Human Rights Watch. Um, so a bit later of a bloomer in human rights than probably almost everybody in this room. Thank you. Um, so yes, here there are a lot more human rights opportunities now, and it can be hard to choose what we want to focus on, choose one specific research project or one specific even major. Um, so how did both of you choose the human rights geographic regions and topic areas that you wanted to specialize in, and how soon did you have to do that? Um, so in the work that I do now, I don't necessarily have a geographical focus. Um, I, when I was a Duke, I, for similar reasons that I included in my response earlier, my geographical focus was South Asia. Um, that's the part of the world I knew the most about in some sense, but it's also still remained as the part of the world that I wanted to learn, learn more about every day and continue to have that interest in. Um, so that's where I learned, it was in that context that I was exposed to a lot of the issues that I continue to work on. Um, the area of work, which is um, women's rights and empowerment, uh, that's been in sort of an ongoing stream um, from a very long time ago, although, I don't know, five years ago, I probably would not have been able to articulate it in those terms. Um, a lot of it was owed to a chance. Um, the, an internship opened up here that happened to uh, be a women's NGO, and I took up that opportunity and sort of went into that and learned more and piqued my interest. Um, but it was also a lot of the issues that I could relate to as a colored woman uh, myself. So it was a mix of two things, partially intentional, partially chance, uh, and a lot of that just had to do with um, being OK with uh, sort of roaming around a little bit and not knowing where you'll end up uh, necessarily. Um, and um, again, on that point, uh, I right now the work that I do is on humanitarian response. 
and there, um, that was also new to me. Uh, I had more of a background in development, and in, uh, there, surprisingly, there is a bit of a divide between these two fields, I shouldn't be, but in reality, there is. Um, so I wasn't sure if this is what I wanted to do, but even in the short uh, span of my uh, career, which is just two years old, um, it, things have changed. Increasingly, people are calling for, we need to bridge this humanitarian development nexus, and the fact that I have a development background uh, help. I had uh, I had an interest in the in the Middle East as a region. So as I mentioned, I um, uh, I had always been sort of uh, international studies oriented, and uh, I guess there were two things that that brought me to the Middle East. Um, one was that uh, I was I think a senior in high school uh, when 9/11 happened, and um, at that time there was sort of a huge. Uh, well, I guess in the years after, there was sort of a huge influx of students into Middle Eastern studies type programs. But I would say the vast majority of them were coming at it from sort of a security studies perspective. Uh, you know, how do I get into to intelligence services? And um, that's that's different than human rights work, you know, I, in my opinion. Uh, and, and I think that for me, uh, I was attracted to the idea of looking at the Middle East from a uh, from a at the originally, not necessarily a human rights perspective, but from sort of a cultural perspective, which then developed into a human rights perspective. Um, so that was one, I was sort of a child of that generation in some, in some ways. Um, the other thing is that, uh, I, this won't shock you with my name, but I come from a Jewish American family. And um, I, uh, to be a bit stereotypical, my family was very sort of progressive in most ways, but on the question of Israel and Israel-Palestine, uh, I was, what presented with what I would now consider a fairly unnuanced uh, view of it. Um, and just not, not necessarily by my family, but by various institutions. Um, and so for me, that always occupied a, a sort of larger than life spot in my imagination and drew me to specifically to that issue. Um, so over, uh, over the course of uh, summers during Duke, actually, I spent, I think, three or four of them in, in Israel-Palestine um, doing work. Uh, and actually time working for sort of pro-peace organizations, although that's a very, um, I think, loaded term, and it really depends on your perspective. Um, but that was, my, that was my draw to the Middle East. Um, one thing I would say, and Julie and I were discussing this, is that there, you know, and we could talk about this a bit later, but, um, you know, focusing on, a, on either a region or a topic is, is obviously positive and eventually something you need to do in the human rights field, but there are also drawbacks and reasons to also be be confident about being a generalist. One is that you, you know, as, as I'm sure we'll discuss, it's very difficult to break into the field, and so you want to sort of cast the net as widely as possible, and then eventually sort of find your niche and then maybe maybe zoom in. Uh, and the other is that you do risk getting pigeonholed, and, and you know, you'll find over, uh, I think for a lot of people, you'll find that over the years your interests could change and shift a little bit. Um, so it's good to have, I mean, most human rights organizations are structured where divisions are either topical or either thematic or geographical. Uh, but with that said, it's not a bad thing to have, a, to have also sort of a generalist background, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what parts of working in the field of human rights do you find to be the most challenging? Um, and this is alluded to earlier, I think, in uh, one of the uh, research slams, one of the wonderful ones. Um, slow progress uh, in things. I mean, again, uh, uh, you had highlighted this, the list of demands um, from decades ago and today, it's the same thing. And that can be uh, um, a little exasperating. Um, and, you know, I mean, I specifically work on uh, humanitarian response and crisis response, disaster response. Uh, so a lot of it is sort of immediate need, and you know it's always go go go. Um, but the times that you you do, and they're always asking for more funds, always asking for more resources. The needs are ever increasing. Um, but when you actually step back and look at you know a graph, say um, the funds that are needed from 2016 to 2018 are the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance. It's that 140 million people in need of humanitarian assistance this year. You have those days. Um, but at the same time, you also hear then some stories. And this is harder to sort of capture when you're sitting in New York at an HQ and not in the field. So you don't really see some of these things uh, firsthand. But uh, the times that you do reach out to, say, uh, for us, for 
to our country office and you talk to what's happening there, to our colleagues uh, about what's happening there. Um, the other day, there was a story about how, um, uh, for example, uh, it's been going on since 2011. Um, what's changed, a lot hasn't changed. Um, things have grown worse in some senses. But um, the sort of silver lining there is um, as a result of some of the work that we've done, uh, groups of women have come together. Uh, they, um, they have approached governments, um, private foundations, um, powerful, influential people together uh, in a stronger position than they were in. Uh, so they no longer um, identify themselves simply as victims. Uh, neither do others identify these women simply as victims. But they've come together as uh, people with demands and um, with opinions and with input, very valuable, critical input and in what needs to happen. So that um, so you do hear stories like that on some days and that, that keeps you going. Um, but this world of human rights is one that um, it, there's slow progress. Um, and uh, the f I think uh, utter conviction that this is such important work that needs to happen across the world, across sectors, um, is the strongest motivating driving force that can uh, keep you going. Um, but I think that's um, one of the biggest sort of um, ever expansive challenges that I've experienced. Yeah, I, w I think Arpita really uh, perfectly encapsulated it. I, I would just really echo that. Um, the question of impact. Uh, I, maybe we just add something to it or make it make it more personal. But there's the question of you know what are we doing? Is it having an impact? Which is something I think you struggle with every day. Um, which I'm you know I think that those of you, a lot of people in this room have already worked on human rights issues, and I'm sure you already feel that way. Um, another dimension to consider is that in the in the career context, there's also the question of do I want to work in a specific job? where I will be, say, interacting with the folks on whose behalf I will be advocating with for every day. So for example, I work now on the situation of migrant workers coming from India and Bangladesh, Nepal, to the Gulf. I get to the Gulf four or five times a year. I get to South Asia twice a year. But I sit in New York. I sit in an office in New York. And um, when I worked on Iran, I, as you might imagine, the Iranian government was not thrilled about my, my boss, the, the UN Special Rapporteur, and so we were not uh, permitted to enter the country to conduct our work, and so we conducted our work uh, via Skype interview. We went to uh, cities where uh, the Iranian diaspora, um, uh, where the Iranian di diaspora exists in, in very large numbers. We also con conducted a lot of interviews into Iran via Skype and, and Secure Line. Um, but there was a l little bit of a level of disconnect. Um, this could be sort of a case of the grass is always greener. You know, when you talk to people that, that are sort of in the field, and uh, in the field, I think, is sort of interestingly used as, as, as you know, being in any sort of area that has non-white people uh, in human rights. So it's kind of a weird, strange term that I think could probably be reformulated. Uh, but that is the term for better or for worse. And the more, you know, South Sudan is like the, the real field and uh, it's a, it, there are like levels of the field. But, um, but being, sorry, go, going on an aside, but uh, when, you, uh, when, you are, um, when you're in the field, you know, the people that I speak to um, have their own frustrations, right? They do interact with, with the people on whose behalf they're advocating uh, every day and their frustrations are also immense for, for different reasons. You know, they also feel like, what am I doing? You know, I, I see this this region every day and nothing's changing. I interact with this government every day, nothing's changing. Um, but similarly or conversely, you can have that, the feeling when you're sitting in an office that, you know, am I, you know, not only do we as a community or do we as the people that work on this issue have an impact, but do I have the impact that I want to, am I situated to at least to feel that contact? Um, but overall, I think that is the, that's the constant uh, mental struggle, I would say. Thank you. Okay, we are going to do a creative problem solving approach with a brief pause and go back to one um, student research presentation that didn't quite get to make it in because we switched the timing. Um, so a student who works with the um, Alabama Center for Rural Enterprise, works with Catherine Coleman Flowers, is going to come up and just do his brief two minute thing. Um, so. Yeah, you can stand here and you um, there's a timer for two minutes, so you just press start and then it counts you down. Okay, cool. Hey, y'all. Good afternoon. Um, how's everybody doing? Good. Good. Uh, sorry for being 
I, you know, all think all those things got switched up. So sorry for kind of being in the middle here. Um, how do I? So I start the countdown by this. Okay. Great. Okay, so um, I'll speak really quickly. The first thing that I should mention is that uh, it's really, really cool to be representative of Acre, but I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and a whole bunch of people from all over this university in Alabama and nationally who are doing this work, uh, including Ms. Flowers. So it's, um, it's really an honor to be representing that project. Um, I've been involved since uh, September 2017, and in that semester, in the fall semester, uh, my work mo mainly focused on tracking financial flows from the Economic Development Administration within the Department of Commerce uh, to see where have investments on projects that focus on uh, economic development. That could be uh, the construction of sewers or municipal water systems. That could be the construction of roads, shopping centers, literally you name it, anything that promotes economic development brings jobs to economically distressed regions. Uh, so we looked at where that money was coming from in the past five to 10 years um, and see, and so that we could see, is it coming to places like Lowndes County? Is it coming to places like the Black Belt? Um, or is it being concentrated in other locations? And that work, that work continues, those financial flows. Um, and tracking that is really important to be able to figure out how can we bring more money, more investment to this region um, in the future uh, so that folks who are living down there can have adequate uh, wastewater sanitation. Uh, the second thing, wow, 47 seconds already. Um, <laughs> the second thing that I've been working on more this semester uh, is doing research and charting the timeline of environmental justice issues both nationally and in Alabama. And you learn, you learn some really cool things. One thing I wanted to just uh, pull out is that um, as early as 1998, as early as 1968, um, you have folks organizing in Alabama, one group in a uh, town called Anderson, Alabama, formed a group called Citizens Against Pollution uh, to protest and organize against the dumping of PCBs by Monsanto. And so you start to see this long timeline of, of folks organizing um, against much, much more powerful forces and winning. That group, CAP, ended up did winning a huge settlement from Monsanto later on, even though cleanup efforts continue. So we want to chart that and then create um, a a resource online uh, so that folks all over can know more about environmental justice in Alabama and nationally. So, thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thanks, everyone, for for switching back and forth. So. Um, I have a question related to human rights work and how difficult it can sometimes be to deal with human rights violations, um, potentially disheartening or potentially just hard on kind of the psyche. So do either of you make an effort um, to carry out self-care? And if so, how do you do that? My answer is basically no. So <laughs> <you're doing> <laughs> Uh, to, I mean, to give a very honest answer, I haven't, uh, I sitting at, in New York in a, you know, on the 18th floor of a skyscraper, I haven't really been exposed to some of those things, but, um, and to use that uh, phrase in the field, it can, uh, just listening to the stories from my colleagues at least, I mean, there, I think you do have a greater need for it, um, where, uh, yeah, and I think one of the things that can make a huge difference is the team that you work with there. Um, that can be an immediate supervisor, that can be uh, colleagues um, uh, in your own team, uh, the host community that you work with. Um, so I think the group of people that you work with, um, how supported they can be, uh, can really make or break um, your ability to do so. Um, but I don't really have those many tips. Uh, to give because I haven't really thought of that myself. Yeah, I, I, um, I probably don't do a good enough job of that. I agree with Arpita though that you know when that if you're in the field, it obviously is more necessary. I think. And um, with that said, though, you know I, I, I do conduct um, uh, I do conduct research in uh, South Asia and the Gulf, and I do find that uh, it can be somewhat taxing. I think that you know you, uh, especially when you're working with. Um, uh, alleged victims of human rights abuses for prolonged and, and continuous periods of time, it can definitely weigh on you. And um, and I think that because I think I'm also based in New York, I've also I've sort of used that as the well. I'll be back home in a few days, you know, and that's probably not the best way to approach it. Um, one exception would be uh, when I when I was working at Human Rights Watch. Um, the Arab Spring uh, overlapped with my tenure there. And so it was a really interesting time because I worked for the Middle East North Africa division and that division went from sort of a, you know, put out a once a month press release, Qaddafi, you know, stop doing the same crap you've been doing for the last 47 years to basically, you know, seven press releases a day 
frenetic pace. I was working till two in the morning, sort of like investment banker, banking hours. Uh, and I was like, I didn't realize I had signed up for that. Um, but um, I, I probably, you know, I was, it, was, it was a difficult time uh, just in terms of the workload and we were getting calls from the Middle East off the hook all day. And so even being based in New York, I think they're, you know, and they, they had sort of people come in to, to assist with self-care, but I didn't take advantage of it. And I told myself I didn't have the time, but in retrospect, I, I should have done it. But I would highly recommend it, especially if you do end up in the field. And if I may actually add, I mean, I was thinking back um, to the first experience that I shared, uh, which is when I went back home, and I really thought that that was going to be the easiest thing to do. I mean, this is not a new place for me. Uh, I grew up in that place. Uh, I think part of the reason why it was so challenging was because I underestimated the challenges um, that I was going to face. Um, it helped. Um oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm the late guy. <laughs> Uh, I think it made a difference that I uh, felt comfortable enough to sort of talk about my daily experiences there with uh, my parents or my family who was there because I mean it was very similar I mean I would spend days sort of taking down uh, case notes um, from an uh, 11 year old girl who was abused by her grandfather uh, and that was not easy to listen to and you sort of have to keep asking questions and um, absorbing that isn't really easy, especially when you know this is someone who could uh, be right next door uh, in your same community, part of uh, what you call home. Um, so, it, I mean, it, this is a very simple, almost normal thing to do, but just talking about these experiences, you know, uh, helps you unpack what these things mean to you uh, and to sort of uh, come to terms with these realities. Uh, it's not going to go away just because you don't expose yourself to them, but um, just helps you come, sort of put it in context and move on yeah thank you all right um, now I'll welcome Hardy view who has made it um, just in time um, and I'll read his bio so Hardy view is legal director at human rights first and as legal director Hardy leads and directs the organization's legal initiatives including its pro bono legal representation legal outreach efforts and litigation initiatives Hardy manages Human Rights First refugee representation work, which pairs lawyers at the nation's top law firms with refugees in need of counsel. Hardy started his legal career as a law clerk in federal district court in Denver, Colorado, and from there he served as a criminal appellate defense counsel in the United States Navy's Judge Advocate General's Corps. Later, he was in private legal practice for over 10 years. Hardy has written for the New York Times and Huff Post and appeared in numerous outlets, including CNN, NB NPR, and BBC Radio. Since January 2017, Hardy has taught a seminar at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, focusing on the role of non-governmental organizations in policy formulation. Hardy is a 1997 graduate of the University of Michigan Law School, serving as editor-in-chief of the Michigan Journal of Race and Law and Ford School of Public Policy, where he earned his Law and Master of Public Policy degrees. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Duke University in 1993, where he was student body president and later president of the Duke Alumni. Association. So welcome, Hardy. <laughs> um, I'll address you with one of our earlier questions, just to go back to those while we have you here. Um, we discussed what drew each of the panelists to human rights work and how they ended up in that this field, um, and also how you chose what you wanted to specialize and focus in. Thank you. First question what we do. What drew you to the human rights field and how you chose what you wanted to specialize in? You still need that just because we're OK, got it. Um, uh, so what, what drew me to human rights work? I, I think it was, I, I know the exact moment, but I'll start for more philosophically. <laughs> I'll go broader. I'm not sure if you could pinpoint it, but I think I can. Uh, so for me, it was, I, I grew up in an immigrant household. I'm originally from Haiti, um, so all my friends. Uh, family members are Haitian. I also grew up in Mexico. And so I, I think I had a keen sense of um, uh, what it means to live in a place, this is referencing Haiti, where uh, rights weren't respected. Um, you know, so my family grew up under the Duvalier regime. And so although that was foreign to me to some extent, I heard a lot of stories about it from my, from my family members. And remember in the 70s being there and not being free to do a lot of things because my grandmother would say to me, it's not safe to go out, um, uh, that there are militia in the street. And so although I didn't fully understand what that meant, I could remember the restrictions and the lack of liberty and, 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 and how that impinged upon my way of life. 
And then as I grew older, I think seeing um, uh, uh, people in my community in New York City and um, uh, particularly in my neighborhood um, not have a fair shot at succeeding in life, that was always something that was in my, in my blood. And so when I came to college, um, for me it meant that a legal degree was the way to sort of work through that. And I've since learned that's only a way. There are so many ways. Um, so in terms of my, my exact moment, I was um, working in private legal practice for a number of years and um, the earthquake in Haiti occurred. And I, through Duke, as it turns out, I was able to go down to Haiti and help a group of uh, medical providers provide medical care to Haitians affected by the earthquake. And I was, we were living uh, in, a, in a building that had some, uh, it suffers from some structural damage and we were sleeping on the roof of the building uh, because the civil engineer with us suggested that sleeping inside of the building was a really bad idea in case there were aftershocks. So I was like, who am I to doubt the civil engineer? <laughs> so he's sleeping on the roof and I remember one light night as I was trying to fall asleep, um, I had a Blackberry then um, and it worked incredibly well and I was getting emails, tons of them from this opposing counsel who had accused me of withholding documents in this litigation that I should have given them. And I remember reading this email and thinking to myself, I don't care. <laughs> um, and, and I thought, what I'm doing here, I think, is more relevant than what this guy is accusing me of doing. And at that moment, I realized, I think I'm doing the wrong thing, um, because my client cares. Um, so although it may not be the most poignant thing in my, my life at the moment, my client has an interest, and maybe I'm doing my client a disservice by not finding my path to another route. And so days later, um, after I returned to the States, I was having a conversation with our then university president, Richard Broadhead, and I was explaining to him the guilt as a Haitian immigrant that I felt for thinking that I should abandon my law degree to go do something human rights related. And his essential response to me was, one, get over it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and two, that even though, because I, I was saying I was trained to be an advocate, this is what my parents sent me to school for, this is why I have like $100,000 worth of debt. And he was saying, what makes you think you still can't be an advocate in the human rights sector? And I was like, absolutely, I think of that myself. So um, hence uh, an, an attempt at that point to try to make a pivot out of what I was doing into this world. Thank you. Um, and to circle back to one more question, sorry to put you on the mic once more, but um, what um, part of working in the field of human rights do you find to be the most challenging? You, you two didn't answer all this already? You, yeah. 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 Just smiled or something. Um, <laughs> the most challenging, I think it's uh, being clear on what we, on our mission. I know that seems sort of obvious, but I, I think there are days where my struggle is, I, I, I'm so passionate about this set of issues, and I have to discipline myself to say, but I'm actually working on this set of issues. And, if, and when I fail to discipline myself, I get into a lot of problems. Like I end up in places where I'm not an expert, I end up expending resources that I ought not to. It's something I, I it's called mission creep. And it's real, in the, at least in the human rights world. It's, I feel like it's something that, on a daily basis, that I have to struggle against because I often lead with my heart and I have to pull back and go, you know, passion is necessary but not sufficient. Um, and so I, I've got to really deal with that challenge on a, almost a regular basis, and I think my organization does too. Thank you. Thank you, so back to all three of you. Um, what sorts of experiences, skills, and qualifications should undergraduates interested in human rights careers, like the ones you have, pursue at this stage in our lives? Um, oh, the mic is here. Uh, uh, this Two things, and I'm sure uh, the other panelists will have plenty to add on, uh, that come to my mind are, uh, um, uh, I mean, language skills. Uh, that's very important. Uh, um, I think especially, I mean, when you talk about human rights, uh, you could definitely obviously focus um, in, a, in a specific part of the world, um, but I think you really would benefit, I mean, you would be enriched, uh, even if you're focused on having a lo global impact, to be influenced um, by the rest of the world, by the histories of the rest of the world, how things have worked in the rest of the world. And um, careers in different parts of the world, I think you, it would be very, very important. Um, so having the language skills to actually do that uh, and to interact with the people there, um, I think it's, it's key. Uh, and the second thing, again, rela related to that is, and I think uh, Duke is wonderful, and the resources that it provides to be able to do this is um, having an international experience. 
Uh, there's, there's so many opportunities here. Uh, Duke Immers, Duke Engage, um, Seoul, uh, and a lot more, I'm sure, uh, that you, know, you can use your summers to study abroad, or go abroad, or work abroad. Um, I think, I mean, regardless of whether it's a human rights career or um, whatever you go on to do, um, it's critical that you have that sort of uh, exposure and you're in a place that, you know, you sort of lose yourself in, you know, have that discovery of yourself, all that stuff that you're supposed to do in college. Um, but those are just two, two big things that uh, come to my mind first. Yeah, we're gonna have to change the order because uh, uh, you keep getting uh, all the I think, perfect <laughs> answers. Um, yeah, those are you know those I think are two of the top ones, and it's it's for a few reasons. I mean, one is that the um, uh, when it comes to, to language ability, language ability is often a good way to break into the field, even if it's not what you'll end up using, um, because it's so competitive. <coughs> and I think we'll talk more about that. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, know that. It's an extremely competitive field. One of the the great differentiators is language, and um, you know some of you, I'm sure, have 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 uh, done some internships. Um, a lot of the internships are sort of in you know quote unquote fixer roles. Uh, another another strange term because fixers often do the vast majority of the work, and they're the ones that actually know about the region. But you sort of swoop in and use a fixer, and you're the expert. Um, but those fixers are very are valued, and it's a great way to break into the field. You know, it's a, a lot of human rights organizations would, would be hard pressed to turn you down if you said, "I speak the language, I know the region, um, and so I could, you know, I could go with your researcher and actually facilitate the research." Um, and then, of course, after after deriding the field earlier, I'm going to now use it. Um, but that is also tremendously valuable. I mean, b all the organizations that you'll be, most of the organizations that you'll be looking at, depending on whether you're looking at international or domestic human rights. If you're looking at international human rights, of course, a lot of the people in the organizations will have international experience. But you'd still be surprised by the extent to which international experience being in the field is impressive to, if not the folks that you'll be working with, at least the HR folks in the companies that are, that are looking at your resume. And it's, it's almost now, I wouldn't even say impressive, it's almost now a requirement to, to some degree if you're looking at international human rights. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you have the means, it's difficult because you often, when you go abroad, it's very difficult to actually make a, to earn a, 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 a wage that, you know, you can sort of live on beyond, that you could save, let's say. You know, you can get a stipend, you can sort of make ends meet by doing things, but to a large extent, you're either going to be volunteering or making very little money. But if you're at a point in your life where you can do that um, and, and you feel up to it, this, this is absolutely the time to do that. The other thing I would add is, and this is not specific to human rights, but um, I, I think it's worth sharing anyway. I, I think the ability to distill complex information <coughs> into lucid, clear, understandable information is a key to success in, in, in what I do in my world. Uh, and I learned that here. Uh, again, I can actually pinpoint it. Um, Fritz Mayer, PPS 55. Um, <laughs> um, so that was, a, that was, I think, the, my first exposure to like taking a lot of data and having to, to kick it back in a way that's understandable. So I, I, in my world, I write a lot, and I write a lot for various audiences. And I, I live by the creed that good writing focuses on the audience, and there's no such thing as good writing as good rewriting. And so my ability to effectively communicate my plan, my objective, my success metrics, all de 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 determines on the, my, depends on the ability for me to take this and sort of bring it down like this, and not to condescend, but to make it accessible. So I'm, for example, I'm filing a brief on Friday at the Supreme Court on the refugee ban. It, we're working the press release. When you read the press release, only like a lawyer of 20 years understands what we just wrote. <laughs> so, so the fact that I just, we just wrote this press release and it's inaccessible to, let's say, my mother, is not really helpful. I need her to read that and then want to reach in her pocket and give me $100, she won't. Um, so, so I've got to understand what goes in and what goes out. And so I think the ability to distill lots of information to understandable uh, pieces that folks can consume, do it to a specific audience, um, and do it in a way that's clear without taking off any of the meat is important. Again, not specific to just this area, but I do think it's a, it's a key to success. And if I may add one more thing, uh, is uh, I think because a human rights career, I mean, there's no one single human rights career, right? And even if you follow uh, a certain strand, chances are that you will sort of move around quite a bit uh, geographically, I mean, thematically and different senses. And um, so on that note, I mean, that versatility is very, very important. And I think, again, Duke, I mean, liberal arts education, it really is important. And I look, looking back, I often, um, 
I'm grateful for all those requirements I had to fulfill when I was here. I'm glad I actually did pay attention and did not just try to pass. Um, so that's really come in handy. Um, when I started this uh, job, I did not really expect to do um, what, I'm do what I've been doing in the past month, which is look at blockchain technology. That was the last thing I expected to, uh, you know, to look into, understand, or read, or communicate about, or explain to other people, for that matter. Um, but uh, again, I mean, it's not that I had the expertise for that field, but you know, having um, gone through an education that sort of forces you to have um, a multi-pronged approach, uh, interdisciplinary studies, all of that thing. I mean, these are so a lot of cash phrases, but I mean, I've come to really appreciate the value of having been put in those um, areas um, where I wasn't completely comfortable, but still had to get through. Thank you. We'll do one or two more questions and then open it up to audience questions. So um, if you got the opportunity to shape your career all over again, what would you do differently? Should I start? Yeah, you, you want to change you it around, right? You have the exact same thing you would change. Um, the, thing, the thing I would like to raise, and this maybe is a, maybe I, I could also pose a question to Hardy, but um, uh, law school. I would like to. Uh, I would just like to raise that because I think that that's something that we should discuss. Um, I went straight from undergrad to to get a master's degree um, uh, directly after undergrad, and I um, and I specifically remember my faculty advisor here uh, when I when I floated the idea, and this was you know this was 12 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, when I floated the idea that you know I'm going to apply right now for um, for a master's program. Um, he said something like, "You know, that's absurd. Uh, it's it's uh, people basically just look at a master's like two extra years of college. Don't waste your time and money." So I proceeded to apply, um, <laughs> <laughs> went straight for the master's degree, um, and you know, in retrospect, there was there was there was wisdom in what he said. I think that uh, I, I I wouldn't actually change that because it led me to the trajectory that I'm on through through a variety of sort of twists and turns. Um, and I love the, the program, the Middle Eastern Studies program that I was in. I just, I, I just really just love that program. But um, master's programs are expensive. Um, they, you know, they are to some degree viewed as, as extra college. You know, you could, you could say that they're almost they're, that in some ways they're required if you don't have another degree. So, so it's not a bad thing. You should do it. Uh, but the question for me has always been, should I have gone to law school? That's the thing that I sort of, that I, I've waffled back and forth on for many, many years, um, until really, really until about a year or two ago where I finally said, you know, okay, I think that ship has sailed. Uh, but, uh, but I bought an LSAT book like a year ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I've always been frustrated because I, uh, when I was really in every organization I've worked at, um, the, the director level positions have been dominated by lawyers. Um, my, actually, my current director, uh, Hardy, is a former co-founder of Human Rights First, Mike Posner. Mike Posner. So, yeah, um, who is a lawyer. Um, but I, I also, um, when, I worked at Human, uh, when I worked at Human Rights Watch, uh, my, uh, the executive director of my division was a lawyer. All of the researchers were lawyers who, at the time, uh, you know, outranked me. And uh, so, uh, but what you'll find is that when you speak to, and, and maybe you'll be the exception, but when you speak to lawyers in the human rights field, they, they uniformly, when you say, should I go to law school or have gone to law school, they always say no. They always say no, <laughs> and I. That always used to frustrate me because I said, "But you're you're in this position because you went to law school. Like, why are you telling me not to go to law school? You that you got here, and, you know." <laughs> um, so there's sort of this catch twenty two. On the other hand, and this drives this drives my wife nuts. We we have this conversation all the time. She also is in human rights uh, in the human rights show. We met at Human Rights Watch actually, and uh, she sort of thinks that I am, uh, you know, romanticizing a law degree because I just happened to work for a few organizations where there were some lawyers. Uh, and moreover, that you know, I'm sort of on a trajectory now where, and this, she was making this argument already five years ago, but where if I would leave and go to law school and, and be out, you know, $160,000 in the middle of a career, set back three years uh, on a trajectory that I'm sort of already kind of on, you know, there are some jobs that would be close to me because I don't have a law degree, but not too many in the human rights world. So she thinks that I'm crazy to to regret it, but um, that's just something I sort of struggle with. I haven't actually solved anything, but maybe problematized it. Um, <laughs> For you. <laughs> I'm still falling. Yeah. You want to go ahead? You want to respond? Not yet. I think there's some telepathic connection going on. Um, I'm glad we switched. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, but for me, it's um, it's been the opposite. So I, uh, I mean, this is not a, the, 
sort of the things that I regret not doing or things that I would do differently. There aren't specific things I can highlight simply because I haven't had the time to make those mistakes or have those regrets yet. I'm sure there'll be plenty more in the years to come. Um, but uh, I agonized <coughs> over this uh, law school question for years and I couldn't make up my mind and as I always do, my, uh, I never want to close a door so I apply for everything and anything. Uh, uh, and um, I couldn't make up my mind, do I go to law school, do I go to do my masters, or do I work before I go back to school? Uh, so I applied to all three um, and um, then um, I decided to go ahead with my masters because, um, because of the silly reason that I wanted to go back to Oxford. I was a visiting student there so I thought okay, Oxford first because I was happy there. I want to be happy for you. I'm going to do that first and then go to law school. But while at Oxford, um, that was really enriching for me because again, um, like yourself, I went and did my masters right after. And I had similar thoughts, you know, I, I think I would have gotten more out of this masters if I had some work experience. Um, so I think there's some truth to that. But at the same time, I learned a lot from the more experienced classmate that I had. I was one of the youngest. Um, so every classroom discussion, every joke that they would make, were, it was all insight to me. It was all very exciting and new to me. So I was just absorbing uh, during my year there. and. Through that, and now they're my lawyers, actually. Uh, so that sort of gave me the confidence to sort of go ahead and um, you know close that law school door, at least for the <laughs> meantime, uh, and just go uh, try working. And so far, it's been uh, it's worked out for me. I um, I, th I mean I, I I still got those LSAT books in my suitcase too. Uh, so I've got those lying around as well. Um, but I mean that. Uh, and more the, the more people I've met, I've seen uh, how diverse the paths that they've taken have been. Uh, some come from working with civil society organizations for years in the field. Um, some have a legal background. Some have come from the private sector, um, all sorts of places. Some have been in the UN forever. Uh, and they all bring different things to the table. And I think uh, the sector is richer for that. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered any questions, but and um, just to sort of respond from this end. Uh, I think, David, you're about $150,000 richer, and so I envy you. Um, so yes, I, so obviously I went the law school route. I, I don't regret it. Um, I, I can't imagine what other route I would have taken because that made sense for me. So I, I'm, I'm not one to say go to law school, don't go to law school. It's a really highly personal decision, not just law school, but whatever path. Um, for me, it, was, it made sense because I, I, I had long envisioned myself as an advocate. That's just the best way I can put it. Is I, and, I, and I felt like, in the most traditional sense of the word, word, I wanted to be in the well of the court fighting the good fight, right? That's, um, that, that, that's the best adage I can come up with. And it made sense to me, but I had a suspicion while I was in law school that I was gonna get restless of being a lawyer. Uh, and so I one day literally got lost on campus at the University of Michigan and ended up at the public policy school and had a conversation with their dean of admissions, and within a half an hour, I think she hoodwinked me into applying. Um, and it, it, was, uh, it was fortuitous, because it, it, I think the, the two allow me to, to the extent that I'm successful at what I do, I think as a result of two degrees, I can get into certain rooms, or as I say, I can get a seat at the table, and then those same backgrounds allow me to keep my seat at that table, in other words, to have the credibility that I don't get, you know, sort of like, feel free to leave this conversation because you're not adding anything. Um, so I think those two degrees do it together. I'm not sure that's the case for everyone. DC is a lawyer's town, right? That's just, it's the, it's the it's, you throw a stone, you'll hit a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but I don't think you, need, you have to have the degree by any stretch. Um, I think in actually in having the degree, the downside for me was there came some, as I alluded to earlier, like a burden that I had to follow a certain path because I was a lawyer. And, and so I think I missed a lot of options because I was so obsessed with connecting the dots frontward, if that makes sense. So I'm sort of like, well, I'm an A, I gotta get the B, B, I gotta get the C, C, I gotta get the D. I, I was at a law firm and I was up for partner and, the, and one of my partner, one of my mentors said to me, you ought not get partnered. I was like, why? Well, with, with advocates like you, I certainly won't get partner. And he said to me, you shouldn't get partner because you don't want to be partner. It's just the next thing on your list. <laughs> he was right. I didn't get part of it. <laughs> but he was absolutely right. I was just going from C to D to E to F, and 
I think <coughs> it was very late in my career that I was able to look back and go, Steve Jobs was onto something when he says you can only connect the dots backwards. Mm -hmm. And had I done it differently, I probably would have availed myself of some opportunities that were available to me. Like I, I got a job offer at one point to head up the marketing department of a, um, a, 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 an organization doing um, development work in, in, in developing countries and they, were, they had some uh, technology where it was a posted side stamp and you could take a drop of blood and it, and, it, and it gave you a liver function test, it gave you an idea of that person's sugar and so forth. And this organization was based out of Harvard and they hi wanted to hire me to be the marketing director and I was like, I'm a lawyer, I don't do marketing. I don't know if that was the right idea but looking back, they might have saw something in me that I failed to see myself because I was so obsessed with being a lawyer. Um, and I think if I had listened to some of the folks in my ear long ago, that I would realize that the way I crafted my life or the person I was, was not simply defined by my profession and by the degree that hangs on my wall. And I would have done myself a, dis a service by not being so boxed in into going to that next dot that I feel like I need to connect. Mm -hmm. I have again got one more thing to add, um, and this is not, um, this is sort of broader, but one thing that I wish that I had done while I'm still working on is, um, and I think I've heard this um, similar experience from more female colleagues and female classmates, it's um, just to be comfortable and asking for help. Um, I think that, you know, just in college and even uh, to this day at work, uh, I'm very hesitant to be like, can you, can I take up some of your time? Can I, uh, am I, you know, worth your time? Uh, I'm, I, it's something that I'm conscious of now at least, but I don't think I was even conscious of while I was in college. And I, I mean, the four years that you spend in university, you come across, I mean, your professors, your classmates, everyone's doing incredible stuff. You have speakers coming in. Um, so don't be hesitant to ask for help. That doesn't mean that it's because you don't know A, B, or C, and that you know it's okay if you don't know. Uh, and people are um, very willing to share their experiences because, in some senses, then you're also validating them. So it's also you know good for people to you know to be asked for help. <laughs> um, but so that's something I think I really would have uh, done differently. Um, you know, if I was more, if I were more conscious of this earlier on. Thank you so much. I will say that I certainly do not know if I'll be going to law school after this. <laughs> Different responses. Um, now we can open it up to audience questions if anyone wants to stand and share. I'm a senior now, but I know a lot of people at Duke especially have um, a hesitancy to go into human rights and because it's not, it's not investment banking, it's not medicine, it doesn't, it's not guaranteed to fill anyone's pockets. Um, and I think well, I mean, what would you say to people who are like, well, I have loans to pay off, you know, like, I have to do A, B, and C before I worry about anyone else, um, even though maybe they, they do like it. I mean, what would you say to people who are considering, like, a, a sort of a financial, um, I guess, like, a, a certain financial standard that they have to meet, um, but also, like, maybe do want to do this kind of thing for their career? I, I think it's, uh, I, I would say that that's totally understandable, honestly. I, I, um, I think that part of the problem with the human rights field is that it's, it's very, um, it's dominated by people that come from privilege, um, because you have the opportunity to uh, intern for, for free, you know, in high school and college, and, uh, and you have the opportunity to, to, to maybe get that extra degree. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, they, they didn't have that, they, you know, got scholarships, and but um, but to a large degree it is. So I to me, you know, if somebody has said, well, well, that's great, and I believe in the same cause, but I need to pay off loans, and you know, I this in this country that's a real concern, and I, I have no, I, I would never judge a person for that. One thing I would say is that um, one thing I would recommend is that if you're of the mindset that you'd like to end up in human rights, but you want to spend a couple years sort of making enough to pay off your loans or whatever, uh, I would just caution that things very often don't work out that way. Um, as I think all of you know, you know, when you when you go into investment bank, you don't end up in investment banking because you burn out by 28, but you stay in the corporate world. Um, and uh, you know, more often than not, you're not going to make that transition because life gets in the way. So just I would just keep that in mind and, and just try to stay as focused as possible. I'd say two things. First, there, there are no guarantees. It's just that uh, you all know that, and I think Dave just hinted that, that you could have the best laid plan, or as Mike Tyson used to put it, um, 
everyone has a plan until they get, until they get punched in the face. <laughs> um, so, which is really true. So I, you know, I was on campus in February of 2012. I was attending a board of trustees meeting. Life was good. I went back to, camp, went to my office at my law firm on a Tuesday morning. I got a phone call from my chief HR officer who never speaks to me. And he said, come see me. And I was like, why does he want to talk to me? And he was like, so you've got two more months left here. It wasn't a discussion matter. It was a, you've got two months left. Thanks for your services, but you're expensive and uh, we got to cut some expensive people and you're it. But just days before I thought, you know, like it was all set. And so I went from that moment to um, like thinking my world had ended. Um, and it felt like that at the end because I had a plan and I just got punched in the face and I had no backup plan, right? I was just like, and, and the first thing that came to mind was I failed, right? That I somehow, you know, my mom and dad are just gonna disown me when they find this out. Um, and I look back and I, as I said to someone earlier this week, I was like, I've, sort of, I've been to the dark side and I'm still standing. In fact, I think I'm better off for that um, uh, uh, experience, but it, it taught me that there is no guarantee, right? There's, I, I could have picked whatever path and you can get punched in the face at any time, I assure you of that. Um, those of us who have enough gray hair can attest to that. Um, and the second thing, it's also not binary, right? I, I, I don't want people to feel like it's an either or option. Like you, you could in many ways do good and do well in this world. It's, mm -hmm. it's not easy, but it can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I worked at that law firm for years, making good money, doing uh, you know, at times interesting work. Um, but my firms also allowed me to do things like, you know, represent a young woman who had, you know, suffered a lot of abuse in her house and ended up stabbing her mother to death 47 times. I worked in that case for two and a half years and probably poured in like $500,000 of the law firm's money into that and they didn't blink an eye. Um, and that was rewarding to me and hopefully to that woman, young woman I represented into the firm. So it doesn't have to be binary. I think you'd have to work at it. But um, it, you, know, you, you, could, you can make money and give back. I mean, uh, the work that I do, I rely on a lot of large law firms and women and men who do very well for a living and I, I'm blessed to have them on my team because they're doing things that I cannot possibly make happen um, and vice versa. So um, I also encourage my lawyers at Human Rights First, it's like do something that's outside of what you normally do in human rights just to also give you some perspective, like sit on a board so that it forces you to think about management decisions and some other things that you might nor not normally encounter. So I would say don't necessarily frame it as a binary context. I've got two mics. Um, yeah, to add on to the last point that Harvey uh, was talking about, uh, is I mean time and again when I know when I was looking for jobs too a lot of things uh, people wanted to in, in the um, NGO sector UN all that was I mean there are a lot of skills like quant skills for instance that's something that I need to work on myself is um, and from a lot of them I even heard that okay there are people who do come in from the private sector who worked for a couple of years there but on development issues um, you know early in their career so they work on I don't know gender issues with Dalberg. Um, you make ends meet, I mean, you do make a sufficient amount of money, uh, and you gain relevant skills, right? Again, I mean, it, it, it does come down to you, it is a very personal thing, uh, because a lot of things come into play, um, financial, where, where in the world you can afford to be then, um, doing an internship um, in, um, in Bangalore, India, will be a lot cheaper than doing an internship in Geneva. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of ways that you know you can sort of go around uh, things, um, and I mean specifically about human internships. So first, I want to acknowledge that I mean this is a huge, huge problem, and only people who come from a certain background can afford to do these things. And internships are often the way into these careers, as, at least as far as the UN goes. Um, but I mean, in the recent couple of months, things have started to change. More UN agencies are um, sort of. Uh, HR policies are changing, they're asking that interns are paid, or at least a stipend is given, so things are slowly changing. Um, there's at least recognition that this is a real issue, and you know, if you don't have a diverse group of people in these organizations, then you're not going to really solve problems. Um, so there is increased recognition of the issue, but uh, I mean, a lot remains to be done. Um, but I think there are opportunities where, I mean, it's not easy to find, but there are opportunities where you know you can, uh, it's a lot harder, but that you can still um, you know, financially secure yourself and still do this work. If I could actually, if I could actually just add um, to something that uh, Hardy said about doing, doing well and doing good, and this is maybe a plug for, uh, I am at the Center for Business and Human Rights, and um, you know, we often, 
uh, we, t we also teach business students uh, at the CERN Business School and, and we, uh, we are often pushing the students and pushing the companies we work with to get certain people involved in, in, in human rights because they're the ones that actually have the impact. Um, that's true of government officials too, but if you want to talk about higher paid positions, you can talk about companies. Even more specifically than that, we often discourage people from uh, I wouldn't say discourage because the, some of these positions are good. It really depends on the company. But in a lot of companies, the corporate social responsibility jobs, the CSR jobs, are not, you know, are not really empowered to ch to make change. They're sort of they they exist. They're siloed away from the the company's actual operations. It's something that they're able to advertise. You know, the CSR department. We built a school, but you also destroyed an entire country. You know, with your mining operations. So great, you know, great job. Um, some companies, some companies' CSR departments are quite good, um, but all this is to say that you know we're encouraging people that are actually in decision-making positions who tend to make more than the CSR folks uh, um, to make the right decision. And um, I'd rather have you know three thousand of them than than none of them, and they make a lot of money. So it's not necessarily a zero-sum game. Uh, now you know I sit on the human rights side of it, and if you're sitting on the human rights side of it, there is a there is a financial sacrifice, especially starting out. Uh, with many human rights organizations, but it's not it's not inevitable. Thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question. Yeah. Um, my question is almost a, a challenge to each of you to just say in you know two sentences or three sentences on a daily basis what your job actually involves. Um, you know, with different terms of policy associate, analyst, legal director. Um, if you just give an overview, and then I also have a, a question for for you, David. You mentioned that you you started working on an issue and had a different perspective to it to your family, and that's something that really resonates with me. I work on abortion rights and have you know very very strong um, opinionated people in my family who disagree. And if it ever you know if you found a particular way of dealing with that. Um, and it can take in navigating that is something you try and avoid and you know we all are trying to be respectful etc but it, it can you know get a lot sometimes thanks uh, sure uh, well thank you for the question um, uh, you, and your experience resonates with me as well um, yeah it's it's a it's a tough one it's um uh, I, I think this is true. You know, this is true for a lot of people, especially because a lot of people tend to work on human rights in the in the country or the region from which they're from. So there's the t there's topical issue like like what you just mentioned, but there are also geographical issues. Um, and when you you know in any human rights context, when you criticize your country or your region, um, you are a self-hating. Insert the 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 the, the noun there. And uh, and uh, you know why can't you you know why do you have to air our dirty laundry in public? Sure, we're not perfect, but you know why do you have to do this? You go around the way, gallivanting in the West or wherever you know talking about our problems. Um, uh, certainly, I've been accused of the sort of you know the self-hating label has has been has been applied, and it of course hurts coming from the people that you respect the most, especially that are that you uh, when you agree with them on almost every other issue, um, or you know uh, I think even more so because then you think you respect them so much. If you disagree on everything, you're sort of like, well, you know, we're totally on different levels. But when there's that one issue that's sort of a thorn, it's it's difficult. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I have great advice on how to deal with it. Uh, um, the person I married was was a great way to, to deal with it because she is from the Balkans and works on human rights in the Balkans, which is also a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's just a ton of ethno-nationalism and, and she faces sort of the same thing, I would say. Uh, so we, we have very similar experiences to one another and we often share those experiences. Um, but you can reach out to anyone in the field because that, those experiences are actually quite common. So I would talk about them with other people. Uh, the more you talk about it, the more you realize that it's not your fault, it's the people's fault that can't accept you and your family and in your communities uh, for not, you know, for, not, for at least not listening to you. They don't have to agree with you. But a lot of people don't listen sometimes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a tough struggle, but there's a huge community of people that face that issue, I think. So to lean on them, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I don't really have much to add on that uh, uh, question, so I'll move on to uh, the, unless you are going to respond to that question, um, to your challenge to us. Uh, um, well, uh, with regard to what I do, um, in simple terms, without any jargon, because you and uses a lot of jargon, um, is that uh, we try and make sure that um, when different countries, uh, different development agencies, 
uh, other UN agencies, different uh, civil society organizations, when they respond to a crisis, be it a disaster, be it a any sort of humanitarian crisis, that they actually pay attention to what women and girls specifically need, what their challenges are, and also make sure that they're empowered in the process so that we don't just treat them as victims, uh, that they're part of the response, they're, they emerge as leaders, and uh, their challenges are addressed. Um, so yes, that's, that's what we do. Uh, challenge. I, think, I, I would say we try to make people who have fled persecution safe. Uh, and, and, and we do so through legal and psychosocial means. That was really good. Um, I've never been able to describe my job in less than 25 sentences. Um, I, I specifically, I try to, this is a really good challenge, I try to get uh, governments and companies to alter their policies so that low-wage migrant workers won't be forced to pay recruitment fees for their jobs, specifically in the Gulf region. Can I, can I take pride of, of, of faculty and ask one last question? <laughs> I, I wonder if I could get each of you to talk a little bit about how you see the world that these students are moving into mm -hmm. in terms of human rights. Right. Like what is your, right. what is going to be happening over the next year, over the next two years that you think mm -hmm. are the, you know, in your areas mm -hmm. and, you know, you can go, go wild. But um, what, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the challenges, what are the issues, right. what are the, what is the situation that you see emerging in human rights mm -hmm. from your perspective? I think a way to do this in a hopeful way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I I saw in a Washington Post editorial that talked about like um, hate on autopilot. Um, that, that's I feel like that's the world. At least I, I work in immigration and refugee protection. That's the world that I believe we we're working in. It's it's unfortunately in vogue to 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 speak in a way that's this is you know the other. And once you, you can demonize someone and separate yourself by calling that person in front of you the other, then you can do all sorts of things that are really reprehensible through policy and through the law and so forth. So that's, I think that's the world that we're coming into. I, I need to also infuse some hope here because um, notwithstanding that, uh, I also see a lot of people, particularly in the United States, stepping up to defend that normally or didn't call themselves human rights defenders. And so I, I'll, I'll give you an example. After the travel ban was enacted in January of 2017, I, I was inundated, we were inundated with phone calls of just a synagogue, um, a mosque, you just name it, just people saying, what can I do to help? And we were pulling long hours. And every day, someone would come in and just bring us free food. And there was just like tons of it in my office. It was just like, some synagogue said, I got you on Monday and Tuesday. And, and I was like, I, I, I didn't ask, they're like, we'll take care of you. So just the, the amount of people who stepped up because they felt that what was happening was unjust was really reassuring and heartening um, to me. So I do think we, hate is in vogue and it's very much an autopilot, but I also th think that there is a crescendo, a wave that is out there that is willing to stand up for our principles and what is truly right. And that lets me get out of bed in the morning. Um, I mean, again, going back to uh, the, the world that I work in, which is uh, humanitarian work, uh, <coughs> like I said earlier, I mean, the needs are growing higher. Uh, and not just that, not only are there more people in need, uh, these crises are becoming more complex. So they have started to last even longer than before. So it's uh, completely possible that a child who's born into uh, uh, in a refugee camp can actually spend the bulk of his or her life there. Uh, and that's terrible. Um, by definition, humanitarian um, context, I mean, this is about basic survival needs. It shouldn't be someone's lifetime. Um, but we're seeing more and more of that. So these things are becoming increasingly complex. And uh, people are recognizing that this is not just about food and shelter. Uh, it's highly political. Um, it involves uh, decision making at all strands of you know power making um, bodies and um, and it's very very global uh, increasingly 
Um, and then uh, within that field of humanitarian work, I, like I said, I uh, focus on gender equality. And I, there I see hope. Um, I mean, the most obvious thing is the Me Too movement. Uh, people mm -hmm. are, I mean, there's people are standing up and at least listening to women. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a, I mean, it's not completely all good all of a sudden, but, um, and a lot more needs to be thought through very patiently, um, but at least there's a pause. So people are listening uh, to these struggles. Uh, there's validation. Um, that hasn't really trickled down to d um, the rest of the world necessarily, so it's taken Hollywood by storm, but that doesn't mean uh, a mm -hmm. refugee woman in, a, in Cox's Bazaar is necessarily treated any differently because of that, or that it's trickled down to that level. Um, and that's what we spend every day doing. We still need to convince um, other big humanitarian actors who've been doing this for decades that we need a focus on women and girls. That's still a case that we have to make, so that, and that's, that's sad, and that we need to make a case for that even today. Um, but I think that that's where um, there's acknowledgement at least, uh, and that's a small step, but it's a first step that acknowledgement is there, that this uh, needs specific attention, that this is a real issue which just can't be clumped up with a lot of other things. Um, so that's where I'll insert that bit of hope. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, w I would also, I'll also finish on a, a, a semi-optimistic note. Um, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that you know progress is not linear. I think we know that from history, and this is something that, that Mike actually talks about a lot. Um, you know, when you look at the the situation of of uh, democracy versus autocracy 30 years ago, uh, you know, it was a much worse situation globally. When you look at global poverty, much worse situation. I mean, obviously these are averages and aggregates, but things are getting better when you take a long view, and so. Uh, you know, in spite of some some serious recent setbacks um, in a lot of countries around the world, in, including I think you could argue in the United States, uh, including in many ways in the United States, um, uh, you know, progress could be something like this. You know, and there's and, and maybe we're we're sort of here in the U.S. We're in one of these moments right now, uh, but that doesn't mean we're not moving forward. And and you know, even just listening to the the uh, you know I mentioned before that I was so impressed with the language that this that the students were using. Uh, that term, you know, even five, six years ago, that terminology was 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 unheard of. Like the, some of some of the words that you're using, the ways that you're describing things, the ways that you're conceptualizing things, uh, are, uh, were not, you know, the way that we conceptualized it five or six years ago. That that proceeds regardless of Trump. That's you know, Trump is irrelevant when it comes to the way that the, the human rights to in a large to a large extent. I mean, obviously. It has dis there are disastrous effects on, on migrants and people of color to certain policies, but the discourse and the way that we progress as a society and the way that we conceive of what is good moves regardless of who's in power in this country or in any country. So I think we're you know we move forward. Um, and the last thing I would just echo with something that you guys said is that um, you know since since Trump has taken office, um, we've seen uh, again just to go back to my to, to my experience with business. We've seen business and other sort of entities that are not traditionally human rights defenders step up in ways that would have been inconceivable. I mean, who would have thought that you know that when the the migrant ban was instituted, it would be businesses that would speak out. That when the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Accord, it would be Goldman Sachs that would write a letter saying this is a terrible decision. If I told you that ten years ago, you would have laughed me out of the room. Uh, and that's true on many issues. Who's leading on LGBT issues? I mean, the NCAA is a business, right? Who's leading on LGBT issues? I mean, they, you could say that they're forced into this position. That's fine. We can talk about how they got there. But they're doing it uh, regardless of and sometimes in spite of or because of what the administration is doing in terms of regressive policies. So, um, so you know, we're moving forward. And I, and I think, you know, there are, there are obviously a lot of fires to put out. And I know, Hardy, you're dealing with a lot of those. And, 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 and you are, too. Um, I think because of the policies that are actually being uh, that, that are being implemented, but there's also reason for hope. Um, so yeah, I'll finish on an optimistic. And I'll add to David's point real quick. That's a, the, the brief that we're filing on, on Friday. It's a, a like I said, it's a refugee ban case, which will be heard by the Supreme Court in April. So the 28 men and women on the brief are all women and men who have served in uniform. So it's the 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 whole right. theme of the brief is how uh, what we've done here is actually not making us safer and in many ways complicating the mission of the service members overseas. And uh, you know, one of the signatories that came on today is a four-star Marine Corps general, wow. who if you looked at his background, you'd say there's nothing in here that says <laughs> progressive or liberal, <laughs> but he too is standing up because he says, this doesn't make sense. So you've got folks who are really stepping into the fray here, um, and I think that's, that's kind of awesome. <coughs> yes.
Thank you so much to our panelists.